Galen Strawson, David Skirbina wrote a book on the history of panpsychism, panpsychism in the West. He also happens to have a long correspondence with the Unabomber, talking about the effects of technology on society, really interesting guy. Uh, Freya Matthews, um, Christoph Koch, who worked with Francis Crick, initially starting this research project in the 90s to explain consciousness in a reductive way as a product of neural interaction. They eventually came to realize that they couldn't actually, they couldn't explain it that way. Christoph Koch became a, a panpsychist, and in his the papers he was writing at the very end of his life, Francis Crick started to think of the brain as a radio receiver. So interesting that neuroscientific research would lead them to a sort of panpsychic perspective. R Rupert Sheldrake, um, Isabel Stengers, a Whiteheadian panpsychist, and Graham Harmon, who I quoted at the beginning. Left off that list, of course, Alfred North Whitehead. Um, Unlike Brassier, who severed the connection between life and thought, um, Brassier said again that thinking has interests that do not coincide with the interests of life. Whitehead disagrees. For Whitehead, value, purpose, meaning are intrinsic to the universe. We have no right, he says, to deface the value experience, which is the very essence of the universe. Existence in its own nature is the upholding of value intensity. He goes on to say, the key notion from which the construction of a cosmology should, be, should start is that the energetic activity considered in physics is the emotional intensity ent entertained in life. So there's a, there's a continuity between physics and life. Physical energy is pulsation of emotion, of feeling. There's no gap between the merely physical, objective, inert world and the subjective, um, you know, phenomenological life world that we live in. Neither physical nature nor life can be understood unless we fuse them together as essential factors in the composition of really real things whose interconnections and individual characters constitute the universe. Um, biology is the study of the larger organi organisms, whereas physics is the study of the smaller organisms. Um, so then instead of physics being the most general science, uh, ecology becomes the most general science because even subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, galaxies, are organisms evolving in ecosystems, um, forming symbiotic relationships. And then outside the relationships of those organisms, there's nothing. Um, you know, Whitehead wants to understand physical law, as, as Jahan was saying, being more like habit that emerges from the interaction of these individual organisms. The laws aren't imposed from the outside, they emerge from the dynamics and the decisions that those organisms themselves make. Um, finally, these unities of existence, these occasions of experience, are the really real things which in their collective unity compose the evolving universe, ever plunging into the creative advance. Um, so this is evolutionary panpsychism. This is not just a sort of pantheism um, where there's one finished unity which from God's perspective is eternal. Um, it, is, it is a creative advance, rather. It's, it's not um, a finished whole, it's an ongoing uh, death and rebirth um, perinatal experience. The whole of the universe is going through that um, death, rebirth mystery. And there's no final form that we can point to um, and unpack mathematically for a, to discover some theory of everything that could account for what there is in, in, based on some eternal principles. Because everything is in process, everything is moving. Um, everything is growing together and dying together and being reborn together. Um, and in that context then, the problem of evolution is the development of enduring harmonies, of enduring shapes of value, which merge into higher attainments of things beyond themselves. Aesthetic attainment is interwoven into the texture of realization. So the last thing I want to say is, is about that last sentence there, aesthetic attainment is interwoven into the texture of realization. Instead of that classical dichotomy between appearance and reality, in Whitehead's panpsychic evolutionary universe, um, appearance and reality are not diametrically opposed. Um, you know, as Brassier was saying in, in one of the earlier slides, he was saying that human beings drape purpose and value and meaning on the outside world, like a, like a, a thin veneer or a veil. Um, you know, it's, it's a mere appearance, in other words. For Whitehead, appearance is reality. Um, aesthetic attainment is 
<laughs> interwoven in the texture of realization, right? So the, f the faintest puff of existence in far off empty space, he says, is already the realization of some value, of some intensity of feeling that has a purpose and a, and a, a meaning in itself. And that initial puff of existence then ramifies and evolves and develops into more complex forms of value and meaning and purpose. But we, there's no such thing as existence without value for Whitehead. So the panpsychist wager, the, the panpsychist speculation is very different than the illuminative materialist wager, which suggests in a very anthropocentric way that all meaning and purpose is produced in the skull somehow. I haven't ever seen an explanation for how that's done exactly, but that's what they claim. So I'm done. I think I have a few minutes um, for a conversation. David, who has the mic? Oh, thanks, Sam. Working? Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Matt, so much. You really got right to the heart of it, and it was so clearly presented. That was really amazing. I'm glad. I appreciate that. So it, it made it clear. I really appreciate the, the, the diverging roads, mm -hmm. although it seems to me like the gravity behind the limitivist um, movement is so large that these things can't act. It's not really a choice either or. So I guess my question is, how how do we bring these together, or do you have? What are your thoughts on that? Um, and presuming we can't just use breath work on everyone. But yeah, just like how? What would, have you thought about the the framework for for bringing these into dialogue and for yeah a, a coexistence? I think there. I have more of an interest in dialoguing with the really hardcore nihilists like Brassier than I do with people like um, Ray Kurzweil and the transhumanists because they're still. They're not nihilists. They're buying into a myth, yeah. a religion. It's just capital, a techno-capitalist progress, the myth of progress. They're totally on board with that idea. Um, whereas Brassier recognizes that that's just another uh, myth that needs to be de disenchanted. That's a form of misenchantment, as I would want to call it. Right. And so Brassier is totally demolishing every possible narrative we could give to our experience, including the capitalist one of we can do better, advance society technologically, and make more profit and raise the quality of life, as yeah. the story goes. Except his own myth. Yeah. Ex <laughs> except his own myth. Yeah, sorry. Heroic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is why the same things that Rick said about psychedelics and astrology could be said about panpsychism. The modern mind is afraid yeah. um, of losing its sole source of agency and recognizing the agency of all these other beings. Um, democracy is messy, and to spiritualize, to, to recognize the this, this spiritual value and democratize the spirituality to all creatures is, um, we have a lot of work ahead of us to accomplish right, that. It's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a lot of work. I don't have any quick solutions cool. to that. Thanks. I think maybe if we go to, till five, we'll still have time for the video, right? I think so. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Ma. Um, yeah, thank you. I really loved that. Um, and also, just related to what David said, this idea of there was kind of this fork in the road and how he was talking about this gravity behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, you brought it up yourself. I feel like a lot of the gravity behind it is just the socioeconomic thrust of history during that course of time, the Industrial Revolution, and the way that we you know, uh, we always talk about it in a way that we were able to dominate matter in a way we never were able to before. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that is we, you know, multiplied the lifespan of the average human being, you know, and we produced tremendous, tremendous revolution, the likes of which human history has never known, of, mm -hmm. of, of, of unbelievable abundance. Of course, there's a gigantic shadow side to that as well, yeah. you know, which is becoming larger and larger and larger every single year to the point where we're just accelerating off the edge of a cliff. Yeah. You know, and so I'm wondering how much of this 
um, paradigmatic shift that has to happen in human consciousness um, has to do with the way that, you know, the way that the socioeconomics of this is also just heading off a cliff, you know, what's the dialectic there, you know? I yeah, know. I mean, a couple of things came to mind, like you talked about the way we've been dominating matter, and I thought something I didn't get to go into with the slide of all the white male panpsychists was that what, I, what I've come to realize is that part of this paradigm shift is having to do with moving away from patriarchy into a re-embracing of, of the goddess um, archetype and the, 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 the goddess herself as a real ontological presence that we lost with the rise of patriarchy and that panpsychism is kind of what happens when white men are, have their ego shattered by the all-encompassing goddess. Like that's what my, white men do when that happens to them. They become panpsychists. Um, <laughs> you know, so you can recognize it as a, as a sort of symptom of that dynamic, I guess. And that um, obviously the tradition is starting to diversify more nowadays you know, a lot of female philosophers are panpsychists. It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. So it's a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, it's it's the individual ego that allows the capitalist socioeconomic machine to continue, and through various means that you know we all talk about all the time, I think that ego can be shattered and forced to recognize this larger encompassing intelligence and community of intelligences that surround us, you know, I think that's, that's part of what needs to happen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Matt. That was a great presentation. Um, I really agree with you that um, in terms of panpsychism, that it's, it's a sound foundation. Um, and uh, I believe that we need to extend the, yeah, the spiritual dignity to, to all beings, and including the earth and, and out further outside of the earth. Yeah. Um, I guess I was curious, um, I want to push back a little bit, and, and that for me, I, I, I see an inherent conflict with, tradition, with some versions of panpsychism in, that, that in saying that, that all, mind, uh, all matter has mind, yet life, it, it took 10 billion years for life to emerge, and then mind came out of that. It's, that's, to me, it seems like that's saying that the first 10 billion years was mindless, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could speak to that, and, um, and maybe just what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, it's a, I think there's a, a shift we have to do in terms of how we understand emergence, the emergence of life, the emergence of mind in a panpsychic cosmology. Emergence doesn't mean the emergence of um, totally ontologically novel um, capacities. So in, instead, it's just a higher order, a, a more intense version of the same that had already been present. So, you know, um, from the very first the primordial flaring forth, the energy that was present there was already, in some sense, um, there for itself. It had an experience of what it was like to be energy radiating. Um, it wasn't conscious and reflective of, it wasn't having thoughts like, oh, I'm energy expanding in this direction. You know, it was more just like totally immersed in the experience. I think one of the things that we have to do um, to understand panpsychism is really get to the, sort of in a process of, through a process of alchemical distillation, boil down human consciousness, which is a very complex form of experience, to its more fundamental levels, so that we're just dealing with very rudimentary and, for that reason, kind of vague and indistinct emotional vectors that are constantly f flowing into us and recognize things like mood, um, and the atmosphere, the emotional atmosphere that pervades our experience. And sort of, you know, one aspect of decentering the human ego is recognizing that the vast majority of our daily and nightly experience, obviously, is not conscious and there are non-conscious forms of experience. And so matter, even before it was alive, had a non-conscious form of experience. Life then becomes a little bit more of an intense realization of that experience and then mind even more so. You know, so there are emergences of more intense forms of experience, but it's not like a radical break where you have to suggest some kind of a miracle 
where life came out of dead matter or mind came out of completely fundamentally non-experiential material systems, you know. Okay, okay Chad and then Brian and then we should finish. By decentering the humans, you're saying that... I don't think it's on, but... Um, by, by decentering the human, you're, you're basically saying panpsychism kind of like decenters the human in that sense. That's basically the impulse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have a giant pushback question, Cool. but it's going to take us 15 minutes or more to discuss yeah. it. So do you want to just, do you want to just ask the question and we can talk about it later? So everyone knows okay, what the challenge well, um, is. <laughs> like, um, uh, the archetypal astrological perspective, uh, does the opposite. It recenters the human being in a meaningful place in the cosmos. Hmm. And we discuss in the radical mythos speculation classes the, you know, the, the, the power of the self-reflective consciousness that we have is reshaping the landscape of the planet. And we have to negotiate that. And the limit of materialism is the direction it's heading, right? Um, but the archetypal astrological actually recenters us in a meaningful way, but actually empowers us and gives us a, an intense amount of responsibility to actually steward in some way, not utilitarianly steward, but... Um, I, yeah, let's talk more about it. It is a 50, more than 15 minutes. Um, go ahead, Brian, just... Matt, um, one reason to study eliminative materialism is to get better at um, presenting ideas because it, it'll get by some of the filters. That's one way, yeah. and that's important. Another way is is to actually um, you know create a new synthesis, something that's even stronger mm. than evolutionary panpsychism. I mean, that may not even be a possibility, but I'm curious as to how you look at it. A new synthesis that combines. Well, no, I mean, in other words. Are you studying eliminative oh. materialism in order to get better, more skillful at presenting evolutionary panpsychism? Or do you find yourself actually coming up with ideas that are actually stronger because of your immersion? Yeah. yeah. Besides Whitehead and Schelling and Whiteheadians and Schellingians, I don't like to read people I agree with. I'd rather read people I totally disagree with. Because, yeah, it forces you to really hone your arguments and, and to point them in the right direction so that you're, you're responding to the claims that, you know, the people who aren't thinking the same way as you are making. Because, you know, philosophy is not just about communicating to the public about what's true or whatever. It's also, you know, um, an ongoing uh, uh, process of, of self-discovery. And, but at the same time, you know, and, and we're concerned with discovering some kind of a truth, then it, it doesn't matter what people's opinions about which one is true. We hope as philosophers we can say something that's true regardless of anyone's opinion about it. But at the same time, we need to, you know, as Theo was saying, we need to like make our ideas relevant to the larger world and the course of civilization and, and speak to the present moment. And I think the present moment is such that eliminative materialism and, tech and uh, transhumanism are at the forefront of the public consciousness, and if, if we don't respond to that, they're gonna they're gonna invent the new story yeah. before we can. Yeah. Um, one more, if it's quick, and then we'll make way for Marcelo. Uh, so maybe just a quick statement of the idea that that possibly we're one helpful way as scholars to talk about this is to to consider the conflation of an experience in like David consciousness with the urge to craft culture and self and society and that if we take those apart and disentangle them and, and, and explain those experiences that stepping in through the red door into the imaginal realm and having an experience of David consciousness quality would be very disorienting to someone who is trying to evaluate the cosmology, you know, for the culture and what would be best. Mm. And if they understood it better, that 
you know, we are a species among species and there are these experiences that will feel magical, but it's an opportunity to be relational and, mm. and to examine our real values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> All right, more, more conversation can be had later, but I'm gonna call it quits, thanks. Yeah.